Welcome, today I'm going to talk about collections in computer programming. Collection is a group of things that are somehow related to one another and can be referred to using a common group label. For example, a necktie collection. Why are we interested in having collections? Let's look at a couple of short snippets of code. First of all, let's um, imagine that we have five numeric data points and we need to calculate an average. Without collections, we'd have to create a separate variable for each of those five data points. So you can see here I've created five variables, datum 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, each with their own value. And then to calculate the average, very straightforward, you up add each one and divide by the total number, which in this case is five. With collections, you'll see below that we've got one variable data, which has all five of the values stored in it. And then we're able to loop through that and able to calculate the average um, pretty easily. Now, if you look at the two snippets, they're about the same number of lines of code, so it may not seem like a big deal, but imagine if we had a thousand data points or a million, or if you didn't know how many data points you're going to have ahead of time, you certainly couldn't create a million different unique variable names to handle all of your data, so you need to be able to store them in some sort of collection data type. So let's start with terminology before we get into the specifics. Um, all collections have individual units which we call elements. Each member of the group is called an element. And elements can be homogeneous, in other words, all the same kind of thing. Uh, that would be a, a collection that had all strings or all integers or all float values. Um, or they can be heterogeneous, uh, where you have a collection of different kinds of things all in the same collection. When you have uh, elements, each element has to be labeled somehow so we can um, access it or refer to it, and that label is called an index. Indices can be integers, uh, which is typically the case with homogeneous collections, or indices can be strings, uh, which is a text and it can be descriptive uh, in the case of heterogeneous collections. Here's an example of using integer indices. Uh, we have a collection here, this, in this case an array called data, which has five numeric values in it. Uh, each value is labeled with an index, and the indices start at zero and count up by one. So the first element is has index zero, the second element has index one, then two, three, four, etc. This may seem odd that uh, computer programmers start counting at zero, um, but once you get used to it, it will become second nature very quickly. Um, if you look here at the little code snippet below, you can see that if we want to refer to an output uh, a particular element in our collection here, then we refer to it in square brackets by the uh, number of its index. In this case, the third element has index 2, uh, and if we did console.log data 2, we would output 94.2684. On the other hand, we have uh, some collections have string indices, uh, sometimes referred to as keys. These are used mostly for heterogeneous collections, uh, where the elements are a collection of key value pairs, right? And the key being something descriptive, descri describing the content of the element value. Uh, something you may run across, so I'm mentioning it now, but we won't go into it in, in great depth, is that a collection of key value pairs is sometimes called a hash table. Um, so if you look at this snippet below, we have a student object here, and it is uh, a collection of key value pairs. Uh, the keys being first name, last name, date of birth, and email, and then the values associated with those. Um, are the name, uh, the date of birth, the email address. And you can see that these are different types of uh, values and they are described by their string indices or their keys. Right? Um, and then if you need to access one of them, for example, if we want to get the last name, uh, it's the same as with numeric indices instead of, but in, inside of the square brackets, instead of putting the 
number, you're going to put the string, which is the name of the key. So now that we've covered the basic terminology, um, there are collections. Collections are made up of elements. Elements could be heterogeneous or homogeneous, and each element is referred to by its index, indices being either a numeric or a string label attached to the element. Uh, now we can look at collection types. Uh, for the purposes of this video, we're not going to get too specific. I'm basically going to talk about the big one, which is arrays, uh, and then I'm going to take everything else and throw it into one big basket called non-arrays. Um, we'll talk about non-array uh, collection types in a different video, um, but for the time being, um, arrays exist in nearly every programming language. Uh, they are almost always made up of homogeneous elements, so all every element is of the same data type and refers to the same type of thing. Uh, they have integer indices, and uh, they can also be multi-dimensional. We'll talk about multi-dimensionality at the end of this presentation. On the other hand, uh, non-array collection types uh, are usually heterogeneous, uh, like that student example you saw before. They have string indices which describe each element, uh, and they're called different things in different languages, so sometimes it's an object or a hash table, associative array, list, struct. Uh, etc. Uh, like I said, we're not going to go too deeply into these right now, um, but we will cover them in a future video. So sticking with arrays, um, it's important to look at some of the common array properties and operations. Uh, these are properties and operations that tend to be, uh, tend to exist in nearly every programming language. So for example, Every array has a length property, right, which is an integer describing the number of elements in that array. You can access an element at a particular index by putting that index in square brackets. Now, not every programming language uses the square bracket uh, syntax, but I would say 80 to 90% of them do. So you're going to see that very commonly. Uh, and if you're doing trial and error with a new programming language, you, know, you can you try that out. Okay, so here are some functions, some operations that are common uh, with array data types. One is push, and that adds an element to the end of the array. Pop, conversely, removes that last element and returns it. Unshift adds an element to the beginning of the array, and shift removes an element from the beginning of the array. Reverse sw swaps the order. Sort will sort elements according to specified criteria. Usually this is alphabetically, um, by default, but you can almost always tell your program uh, how you want your array to be sorted. Concat, which is short for concatenate, allows you to join two or more arrays together. Uh, and then you have index of, which allows you to find the index of a particular element uh, in your array. So it searches through the array for the value that you submit, and it tells you what the index number is associated with that element. A couple more, and this is certainly not exhaustive, but these are some of the more common ones. Filter uh, allows you to submit a function. The function returns a true or false value, a Boolean value that um, helps your program filter out unwanted elements from your array. Uh, each and map are very similar. Um, both of them are apply a function to each element in your array. Uh, the difference being with each is that they are explicit, each element in the array is explicitly handled in order, which means that you can take advantage of that order to uh, do aggregate or cumulative things. Whereas with map, um, each element is supposed to be considered as a, a, you know, a specific, concrete, uh, unique unit, and uh, you can't consider the order. Reduce um, is similar to each, um, and it is specifically used for taking all of your values. Let's say you had a group of numbers and calculating an average or a sum. Okay? So it allows you to reduce all of your values in your array to a single value. All right, so now let's take a look at some code examples. I am absolutely not going to go into depth here. 
Um, the idea being that you can come back and use these code examples to um, study how to implement these array uh, operations in the various programming languages that are listed here. I will go through the first one just so that you understand the format, um, but then uh, I expect that if you are interested, you'll come back and look at these. So starting with JavaScript, right? Uh, if you look on the left hand side is code and on the right there's a comment which describes the current status of the array that we're going to create. So let fruit equal empty square brackets creates a new empty array. Uh, or you could initialize it with data. So you could say let fruit equal banana apple pear, right? That creates a new array with three elements, three string elements. Fruit.push adds a new element to the end, in this case grape. Uh, Fruit.unshift adds a new element to the beginning, in this case orange, and you see that uh, the resulting structure of the array on the right hand side there. Fruit.length allows you to output the number of elements in your array, in this case five. Fruit in square brackets two allows you to add, uh, refer to the element with index two, which is the third element in the array, in this case apple. Fruit.pop removes the last element of the array, in this case grape, and stores it in the variable last, which is then put. Fruit.shift does the same thing with the first element in the array. Fruit.reverse reverses the order. Fruit.concat takes another smaller array, in this case pear grape, and tacks it on to the end. Fruit.indexof Index of looks for the word banana, the string banana in your array, and it returns the first element, the index of the first element that it finds that matches that. In this case, uh, that would set the variable b equal to two. Then you can use two with the splice function. Now splice can be used either to remove an element as, it, as we do first, so splice b comma one goes to index two, represented by b, and removes one element. Uh, in the second usage, splice b0 banana goes to index two, represented by b, removes zero elements, and then adds in an element banana. So you can see here that the first case, splice removes an element, second case, it adds one back. The next uh, function, join, takes all of your elements in your array and concatenates them together uh, in one long string um, separated by comma space. Next there's a function which doesn't exist in all languages called last index of which allows you to get these, uh, the last instance of the element in question. So in this case we're looking for the, the element pair appears twice in this array and we want to get the second uh, or the last instance of that. Um, and so by using last index of, it will give us the index three. Next, we are able to remove that second so we can make our array unique. Um, we use that index to remove uh, the second pair. Uh, next, we sort the array alphabetically. Uh, and then finally we have two functions map and for each uh, and you can see that both of them perform something a, a similar function they both modify every element in the array uh, in the case of map we have written a function to turn everything to uppercase and in the case of for each uh, it turns everything to lowercase and the main difference is that with for each we are going to visit each element in order from the beginning to the end uh, and with map we don't know which order uh, and we're not supposed to care about which order so if you care about order you may want to use for each if you don't care about order um, obviously map here is a little bit shorter in terms of um, the function you can write with okay so here is all of those exact same things pretty much in python in r in Ruby, uh, in PHP, uh, in Java. Now Java is a uh, strongly typed language, whereas the other languages that we looked at so far are dynamically typed. Um, so you're gonna find that Java requires a little bit more work uh, to make things happen. And, uh, and then finally we've got Go, 
Go is still a pretty new language and there aren't a, a lot of built-in utilities. So we actually had to write a lot more code uh, to make the same thing happen. So I didn't comment this one, but the comments are pretty much the same as all of the other languages. Okay, so moving on, the last topic we're gonna to talk about is the concept of the multi-dimensional array. Arrays can have an arbitrary number of dimensions. Uh, you can think of it as an array of arrays, of arrays, of arrays, of arrays. Most of the time, people don't use more than two dimensions. Uh, for example, as the rows and columns of a table. Here's an example of a two-dimensional array. Uh, I've got it written both in table form and also uh, there's a code snippet below. Essentially what we have here is quiz scores for three students in a class. And uh, in the table you can see that we have three uh, arrays, data 0, data 1, and data 2. Each one of them has five elements with indices 0 through 4. Uh, so data zero, the first row, would indicate five quiz scores of student one. Data one, the second row, would indicate the five quiz scores of student two. And data two would indicate the five quiz scores of student three. Uh, you can see that in code format in the snippet below. You can see quiz data equals, and uh, it is an array that contains three other arrays. So um, in order to access one of them, you could do quiz data zero two, and you can see here using two sets of square brackets. And what that does is quiz data zero gets the first row, and then the two gets the element with index two, which is the third element. In this case, that would be the value 65. Uh, and then you can see using a for each, for each will, loop through all of our rows which means I'll loop through all of our students and assign each one of those student arrays to the value scores and then you can use the scores function on the uh, I mean sorry the reduce function on the scores array uh, to calculate the average for each student and then uh, output that to the console and the output uh, you can see there in the comment below. So hopefully uh, this illustrates to you the utility uh, of uh, two-dimensional arrays. They're quite common and they're something that you should spend some time learning how to use. All right, in summary, uh, collections are a fundamental part of pretty much every programming language and so uh, you really need to know how to use them uh, pretty much inescapable. They have some common properties and operations, things like length, push, pop, um, sort, right? things that you can do in pretty much uh, arrays in any language. They may be homogeneous, like arrays, and contain all the same type of element, or heterogeneous, uh, in this case we've said non-arrays, but uh, structures that have um, a variety of different types of data types. And then uh, they, they contain elements, which are identified by indices, which can be integers or strings, uh, and they may be multidimensional. Okay, uh, I hope this has been useful. Uh, please ask questions if you have them.